Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, which is titled COVID-19 Updates, Maintaining Good Health Through COPD Management. Welcome back to those who have joined us for these regular updates. And if this is your first time you're joining in, we're so glad you found us. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You've joined the presentation listening through your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join audio over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio select section of your control panel and the dial in information will be displayed. You can submit text questions at any time by typing them into the questions box of your control panel. We'll spend a few minutes at the end addressing as many as we can. And if we aren't able to get to your question today, uh, we will work with our experts here to answer them separately and post them on our blog. The slide presentation today is provided for you as a handout. You can locate it in the handout section of your control panel. Just click on the title and it will open in a separate window for you to download and save. Before we kick off with the formal program, I would like to introduce Corinne Costa Davis, the COPD Foundation CEO, to provide opening remarks. Thanks, Jamie. Appreciate it. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We have a um, jam-packed discussion today, so I just want to take a few moments to thank um, everyone for their participation. Um, especially Jamie Sullivan, Stephanie Williams, Dr. Byron Tomashaw, and Dr. Melon Han, um, who will be presenting in today's conversation. And also to let everyone know how grateful we are for the ongoing support to our corporate partners who generously contributed to our ability to respond to COVID-19. Um, including Theravance Biopharma for their support of our webinar series. So with that, um, enjoy the conversation. And Jamie, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Corinne. And once again, welcome. So my name is Jamie Sullivan. I'm the VP of Public Affairs here at the COPD Foundation. I will serve as your host today. But to start, uh, as usual, I'd like to remind everyone that the information presented on this webinar should not serve as a substitute for medical advice, and any of the content discussed should not be used for medical device, di medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please do consult with a physician before making changes to your own COPD management plan, or if you have any concerns or questions about COVID-19 symptoms. We will be making the recording of today's webinar available within 24 hours. The, the information presented on today's webinar about COVID-19 was current as of today, May 21st. But as you know, the information about the disease and the recommendations discussed today are changing rapidly. And if you're viewing the recording of this webinar, this information may no, may no longer be accurate. So let's get started. We will begin by covering a few updates on the COVID-19 situation and the ongoing research efforts. We're going to review several frequently asked questions related to COPD management during COVID-19 and discuss what you should consider as states and health systems restart their normal operations. One of the most frequently discussed topics lately on COPD 360 Social has been how to wear face coverings without exacerbating your shortness of breath. So we'll share some tips and, and then conclude with a brief discussion of issues to watch as more states are reopening officially. So the presentations have been informed by your questions. However, we recognize it's impossible to cover everything during the webinar. So rest assured, if your question is not answered today, we will continue to consult with our medical and scientific experts, and we'll be providing additional content online and in future webinars. These topics will be covered by a panel of world-class medical experts. We're grateful for their time and their dedication to informing and empowering the COPD community during a period that is also taxing on medical professionals everywhere. We're again joined by Dr. Byron Tomasha, a practicing pulmonologist and professor of medicine at Columbia University Med Medical Center and the COPD Foundation's chief medical officer. We're also grateful to have Dr. Melan Han with us. Dr. Han is a professor of medicine at the University of Michigan and as a practicing pulmonologist, she's been actively involved in her health system's COVID-19 response. Dr. Tomashaw and Dr. Han will also be joined by the COPD Foundation's own Stephanie Williams, a registered respiratory therapist and the director of community programs for the foundation. Okay, as you can see, we've got an incredible wealth of expertise here today and a packed agenda. So without further ado, let's kick it off by hearing from Dr. Tomashaw. 
Uh, thank you, Jamie. I hope everyone is well out there and staying safe. Uh, most of you have seen this chart before. As you all know, COVID-19 is a new disease caused by a novel coronavirus that is different from the common cold, flu, or pneumonia. COVID-19 emerged in China in late 2019 and is now present in multiple other countries, including the United States, and the numbers continue, unfortunately, to rise. As you can see, there are now over 1.5 million Americans who have been infected and, uh, God, uh, 93,000 deaths, really staggering. And worldwide, there are now over 5 million cases and over 328,000 deaths. And the World Health Organization just announced today that there was a record spike in a one-day one day total of new cases, 106,000 new cases. So we may be making progress, but we're certainly not out of this yet. As far as COPD is concerned, the good news is the reports from China, Europe, and the United States suggest that patients with COPD are not at any greater risk of catching COVID-19. Most studies suggest that only somewhere between 5 and 9% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients have COPD. And a recent survey that is still ongoing on our 360 uh, social site of 595 respondents, only 27 of them have been told by the healthcare provider that they had COVID-19. Uh, of those, only one of them has been hospitalized. And of those, only 12 have actually been tested. And 10 of those tested were negative and the other two were pending. It's an example of how the testing still is not at the level that we need to do, but an example, again, that patients with COPD don't appear to be at particularly greater risk. Now, having said that, if a COPD patient does develop COVID-19, then their risk of developing more severe disease is higher, just as would be for anyone with a significant comorbid condition, uh, particularly if they're getting a little older. We suspect that the patients with the more severe disease are at greater risk but patients with COPD certainly can and have gotten better from COVID-19. Uh, it's important to remember that, but especially as we start reopening the country, it's really important that patients with comorbid conditions, patients with COPD, continue to take all the precautions uh, to limit the chance of getting the disease. Let's take a look at a couple of the, the changes or the data that's developed over the last week or two. So as we've mentioned before, remdesivir uh, is an antiviral agent. It's an IV medicine. It's not an oral pill. Uh, the, uh, there was a large NIH study which showed, suggested that patients treated with remdesivir had a 31% faster time of recovery. Uh, that was clearly significant. There was also a suggestion that there could be a mortality benefit, even though that didn't meet uh, statistical significance. In another study, a cohort of patients with severe COVID-19 who received the drug had a significant improvement in their oxygen support status in almost 70% of the patients. Uh, all of that is good, and all of that would led to the granting of emergency use authorization by the FDA early this month. Uh, distribution is being controlled by the U.S. government, mostly through states and to specific hospitals. And it's important to note that there are multiple COVID-19 drug trials underway combining remdesivir with other agents. Uh, that's really important because that's the approach that has been taken for years with other diseases, tuberculosis, HIV, uh, cancer now. Uh, so these are really progress going forward. Next slide, please. Early, but we're making progress. Vaccines. Uh, as we mentioned the last time, uh, Oxford University developed a vaccine for MERS, a similar uh, coronavirus, which appears to be safe and provided potential immune response to MERS for at least a year. Uh, they began adapting that vaccine for COVID-19 in January, uh, and uh, some monkey data suggested that those, people, those monkeys given the new vaccine did not fall ill despite subsequent heavy viral exposure. And it was just announced today by AstraZeneca that AstraZeneca has received a million, a billion, that's billion with a B, dollars from the U.S. Uh, to push forward with, the, with this vaccine. You know, obviously, there's still work to be done, but it is, it is a sign of progress. And earlier this week, Moderna, a biotech company in, uh, in uh, the Northeast, reported that in, in eight patients followed for six weeks, a vaccine, an RNA vaccine they had developed, triggered a significant antibody response in a phase one trial. Again, that doesn't guarantee 
uh, that there is going to be some uh, level of immunity, but it is suggestive. These are early. There are lots of vaccines being tested. There are a number under human trials. That doesn't mean we're going to have a vaccine next week or next month or even this year, uh, but hopefully it is coming. Next slide. I didn't think we would need to talk about this again, but for obvious reasons, it's become an issue again. Uh, there was a small French study uh, a number of months ago of only 26 patients suggesting that there might be a benefit from hydroxychloroquine, a drug that we've used to treat malaria for years, and a drug that is approved and widely used for treating rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Unfortunately, the data since that early study have been uh, far less, less enthusiastic. It was a clinical trial of two doses of the drug, uh, which was halted because of increased EKG changes, uh, cardiogram changes, and higher mortality in the high dose group. A study just, uh, just released this week suggested that uh, there was no difference uh, in, in hospital mortality of patients who received either hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or their combination or with those who received none of those drugs. And unfortunately, uh, there was a higher uh, there was a, an increased instance of cardiac arrest in those people on the cardiac who received the combination therapy. And finally, a large study, uh, observational study done at my site, uh, which suggests that there was no difference in those being treated or not. Uh, the take-home message is that these results do not suggest its present use outside of randomized clinical trials. Next slide, please. This last slide I have is actually not about COVID-19. Uh, but it is, I think, a really important slide. There was a recently released paper by JAMA uh, of almost 200,000 hospitalized COPD patients. Uh, only a tiny percentage of them, unfortunately, had were initiated in pulmonary rehab within 90 days of discharge. But of those, there was a dramatically improvement in those patients uh, in their one-year survival uh, in those patients who had the rehab initiated within 90 days. Uh, certainly stressing that pulmonary rehabilitation within three months of discharge was significantly associated with a lower risk of mortality at one year. Uh, that's the pulmonary rehab works. We all know that. It has clearly been underutilized in this country. Uh, one of the things we need to push forward with, uh, as we discussed in the last webinar, is to see how tele-rehab, how rehab delivered by telemedicine can work and see whether or not we can match some of these results that uh, actual rehab has shown. It's really important that we push forward. Jamie, back to you. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Tomasha, for sharing these important and somewhat hopeful updates. So now we are going to turn to Dr. Milan Hahn. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I am a pulmonologist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and uh, I care for quite a few patients with COPD. And as I've been talking to a lot of my patients, we've been getting a lot of questions. So we've really tried to think about the questions we're getting most and think about some of the issues that are most pertinent to this pandemic and uh, to do our best uh, to provide you some thoughts. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of a disclaimer out there. Uh, you know, this is in some ways a, what I'm going to call a data-free zone. We don't know as much as we would like. Um, so these are really kind of represent our educated opinions uh, based on what we know and also kind of reflecting what's going on in uh, medical centers uh, around the country. So one of the things that we wanted to, to address that you may have heard is uh, what about nebulizers? Is it safe to continue using nebulizers? You may have heard that, for instance, some hospitals are not allowing the use of nebulizers in the hospital. Um, I think it's important first to remember why we use nebulizers. So there are uh, some medications that are actually only available in nebulized form. Um, for other patients, because they may have dexterity issues or have very limited uh, respiratory reserve, it, it may be that your doctor's prescribed you nebulized uh, medication. And for many patients, it can, it can work uh, very well. The issue that has come up uh, with the pandemic is that uh, the nebulizer can spread uh, viral particles. It can aerosolize viral particles if 
the person using the nebulizer is actively infected. So what does this mean? Well, for one thing, many health systems have now banned the use of nebulizers uh, where often we would use nebulizers if a patient was admitted to the hospital, say for a COPD exacerbation, um, we are looking to other alternative uh, treatments such as meter dose inhalers. So there still are options. Um, so what should you do if you do use nebulized medication? Well, I think the first thing, um, again, uh, to remember in all of this is that I think it's really important that COPD patients stay on their maintenance me uh, medications. Um, and so that's going to be a message you're going to hear from me throughout and from Byron throughout this um, presentation. And I do not recommend doing anything like abruptly stopping your medications unless you talk about it with your healthcare provider first. Um, if you do not have COVID, it is not an issue. The only time it becomes an issue is if you um, have symptoms of COVID or have confirmed COVID. And this is where there may be risk um, for transmitting uh, the virus to someone else. Now, if you live alone, it's, again, not an issue. Um, it, the issue really becomes if you were to be actively infected and you have other non-infected uh, people in your home that are trying to kind of quarantine themselves from you. I think the general recommendations are that if you do are co-quarantining people in the home where one person is infected and others are not, um, in general, it is recommended that uh, infected individuals try to stay in their room. And if you do that, that should help to minimize spread of any viral particles that uh, might be spread through the use of a nebulizer. Other options might be to go out to a closed patio or to a garage that no one else would enter for a few hours. Uh, the data suggests the uh, part viral particles may linger in the air for, say, a couple of hours, particularly um, indoors. Uh, so, you know, that would sort of be our recommendations that you would try to do this in a room uh, that's separate or perhaps on a patio or a garage that you can keep other people uh, out of if you have uh, suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Again, if you do not have an infection, then it's then it's it's not an issue. And if you live alone, it's not an issue. But again, uh, if if you are concerned, Again, this is reason to, to call your doctor, but again, um, really emphasizing this important that patients stay on their uh, maintenance medications because if you were to contract infection, we want your lungs in as best a shape as possible to go ahead and, and to try to handle it. We go on to the, to the next topic here. So the next thing that we've gotten a lot of questions about is what do I do about other things that I may use in the home to help me with my breathing? So. For some patients, that might be a CPAP or a BiPAP machine that you use at night. Uh, other patients may have other types of airway clearance devices that they use. And uh, again, the issues here are, again, very similar to that of the nebulizer. The concern is simply that some of these devices could nebulize or, sorry, aerosolize uh, viral particles. Again, not an issue if you live at home. Uh, by yourself. Uh, not an issue if you do not have um, COVID-19. Uh, like the nebulizers, many hospitals are banning the use of these types of equipment uh, within the hospital, particularly if you have COVID-19. Um, so uh, again, our same patients uh, would apply. Uh, the American Society for Sleep Medicine is recommending that uh, persons who do have confirmed or suspected COVID-19 that need one of these devices, again, uh, use them in a different bedroom. So for instance, uh, if you use a CPAP a device at night to help you sleep, then it might, and you do have COVID, then it would be ideal, for instance, if you would sleep in a different bedroom uh, than uh, non-infected individuals within uh, the home. Of course, nothing is guaranteed but I think this is just a common sense recommendation uh, just, just to try to um, decrease risks. It's also important that you maintain good hygiene on your devices and, and continue to clean them as they should be um, and uh, making sure that you're using you know, clean uh, devices, uh, I think will also help to uh, prevent any further spread uh, of infection if, for instance, viral particles were to get uh, on, on parts of the machine, which is likely uh, if, 
if you do have uh, COVID-19. You would want to keep the um, devices separate from people, probably not let them handle um, those devices until they've been cleaned. Uh, do you want to go ahead and go on to the next slide? Okay, this is an important area. In fact, I saw in the New York Times yesterday that they're concerned that many children will not be getting their scheduled vaccinations that we know children need to get uh, because uh, people have been afraid to go to the doctor, period. Um, and so this is a real concern. We've already got one virus um, that's obviously causing a huge uh, problems throughout the healthcare system. But the good news is that we do have vaccines for some uh, of the existing problems that we had before COVID-19. And for our COPD patients, that includes influenza vaccine in the fall. So we don't have to worry about it right this second, but it is something we're gonna have to think about in the fall. And then um, the pneumonia shots, and, and that includes both the Pneumovax and, and the Prevnar vaccine. So um, we know there's reasonably good data that uh, both the new pneumonia vaccines and the influenza vaccines do help patients with COPD. They each have their own vaccination schedule. Um, and so we're still strongly recommending that if you are due for one of these vaccines, that you still go ahead and get, uh, get your vaccine, stay up to date. Uh, because we, we know that these other, other problems still exist. It's not like they're gonna go away just because of the pandemic. Um, now, having said that, there are steps you can take to minimize your risk of COVID-19 exposure when you go to, to get uh, your vaccine. You can think about the location. Um, some people do go to their healthcare professional's office, but they might be offering curbside vaccinations. Other people, uh, for instance, maybe go to their local pharmacy, uh, and those may be uh, options. Of course, uh, continue doing all the things that the experts are recommending, including wearing a mask, washing your hands uh, often. Uh, you know, I think we are still trying to figure out where this is all going to land at the University of Michigan. I have been seeing most of my COPD patients virtually, but at some point, some point soon, um, I am going to start bringing people in for in-person uh, visits um, as certainly as needed. And, and maybe uh, it'll be some mixed hybrid version in the future of, of virtual visits and in-person visits. Um, we really, really want our COPD patients to be getting the best possible care during this time. Uh, and I think many institutions are taking extreme uh, measures now to try to protect non-COVID patients uh, while in the healthcare system, including frequent uh, you know, wiping down of surfaces, social distancing, everyone's wearing masks, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so I think from what we're seeing, um, this is working. We are not seeing, for instance, large um, swaths of, of healthcare workers that are not exposed to COVID patients getting infected at this point. So um, I am reasonably confident that these measures are working and I do want patients to feel safe if they have concerns, so obviously they should talk to their doctor about where the safest place would be to get their vaccine. Um, look at the website for their local healthcare system so that they, you know what to expect. Um, for instance, I think many places are, are issuing masks, for instance, uh, or asking uh, patients to wear their own in. Uh, visitors in many instances are being restricted. So you wanna prepare for that visit, look at the websites, uh, call, um, but, uh, you know, we we do need to continue to, to care for our patients, and I do think um, that we will be able to do this safely. I, I do feel confident about that, but, it, but I think it behooves everyone to, to be as well educated as you can be before going into the, uh, to see the doctor. Do you want to go ahead and go advance to the next slide? So another, um, some of the questions that we've gotten uh, relate to, in particular, steroids and azithromycin, because many patients who have COPD get steroids and azithromycin, um, either for exacerbations or in some instances, we have patients that may be chronically on steroids or azithromycin or both. Um, and so one question we've gotten is, does being on steroids such as prednisone, which you may take as a pill, or even inhaled steroids make COVID-19 worse? This has been a question that uh, a lot of us have been trying to sort out since the beginning of the pandemic. And what I can tell you is right now, there really is no evidence um, to suggest that 
um, COPD treatment should change during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have no reason um, to believe right now that it increases risk for complications or even your risk for contracting the virus. What's really interesting is when we look at data um, on what percentage of the, of the patients who have COVID had COPD, it's actually currently much less than what we know is the prevalence of COPD in the patient population. I think this is probably um, due to COPD patients being extremely careful, but certainly there's no um, evidence right now to suggest that um, uh, that the medications patients who with COPD regularly take would uh, increase risk. Now, if you are in the hospital, I think what most physicians are recommending, or should you have a flare-up, we still are recommending prednisone should you, should you need that. Um, I can tell you just completely anecdotally, I've had two patients with asthma who, in whom I have suspected um, COVID-19. They both received... Um, uh, Steri Burst and both are doing doing well. Um, I can also tell you anecdotally, and I can tell you this because it was actually in our local newspaper, um, that the very first patient admitted and the very first patient discharged at the University of Michigan with COVID-19 actually had had a lung transplant. So they were clearly on steroids and they, um, uh, believe it or not, walked out the door and never required intubation. So um, I, I don't want, certainly patients with COPD are at increased risk for complications should they get COVID, but uh, we also know there are patients um, remarkably who despite having significant lung issues still can do okay with this. Now another question we've gotten is whether is that their mycin can help prevent um, uh, catching COVID. There's unfortunately no reason at this point to suggest that it's gonna prevent COVID. Um, but because we know it can help patients with COPD, we would recommend go ahead and stay on it um, and it, because it hopefully will help to prevent other kinds of flare-ups if you do have COPD. Do you want to go ahead and advance? Yep. Great. Okay. So I think Dr. Hahn, that is the end of this section, but uh, just before we move on, I wanted to thank you for reinforcing the important message that for the most part, COPD treatment shouldn't change during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate the insights you shared and, and your dedication to helping those who are suffering with COVID-19 while still looking out for your COPD patients. So now we're going to pivot and invite Dr. Tomashaw back to join Dr. Han in a discussion about resuming elective medical care, in other words, non-urgent or life-threatening care. They will lead us through a number of considerations that are important to discuss if you're faced with a decision about whether or not to proceed with tests, surgeries, or even dental care. So Dr. Tomashaw, will you please start us off? Uh, thank you, uh, Jamie, and thank you, Melan, for joining us. Uh, I, I want to stress that just because there is COVID-19 doesn't mean that other medical problems no longer exist. Uh, uh, many people, many of us have delayed following up on some of our medical issues, which are less urgent because of the understandable concerns about COVID-19. Uh, we are reaching the point where, uh, especially as we begin to open up, that those issues have to be addressed. The concept of elective uh, is is does not mean there's not a medical problem. Uh, elective surgery doesn't mean it's not surgery that needs to be done. It just means it doesn't need to be done urgently. Uh, I think we all now at this point need to start making sure that our overall medical status is good uh, so we stay well. Uh, so what sort of questions do, that do you ask? Uh, maybe the most important one is what are the benefits and risks of the procedure to the test itself? Uh, what is the level of COVID-19 exposure risk associated with the preparing for the procedure? Uh, is there an active community transmission of COVID-19 in the area where you're going to get care? How often will you need to go to a healthcare facility to prepare for the procedure? Does it require long-term travel? And if so, how can you limit the risk during that travel? What precautions are the medical facilities putting in place? All of us are going through this. All of us are trying to prepare in the best ways that we can. Will you need to stay overnight in the hospital or will it be done in an outpatient setting? Will your support caregiver be adequately protected from COVID-19 exposure before, during, and after the procedure? 
all of those things, these are a list of questions that are worth thinking about and worth talking to uh, to your provider about, talking to uh, anyone who might be thinking about doing a procedure on you and talking to your surgeon. Uh, we've gotten specific questions about uh, some procedures that are sometimes done in patients with advanced COPD, like lung volume reduction surgery or some of the bronchoscopic procedures. Many of the centers that are involved in those procedures are beginning to plan uh, to reopen. Uh, I would certainly that's the case in our institution, and uh, and uh, I'm sure that's the case with Maylon and many of the other centers. I was in discussion with uh, Dr. Kreiner at Temple, who's one of the leading experts in the bronchoscopic uh, world, and uh, their center is already opening up. So you will see that, and all of us are taking precautions to try to make it as as safe for everyone as possible. Melon. Yeah, no, I I agree, uh, Byron. This is a, a really challenging time, and and centers are kind of opening up in phases, based on uh, you know the prevalence of COVID nineteen and community spread within um, the area. So we're going to see a lot of variation uh, across uh, the U S. And so you'll have to kind of be uh, be patient as the timelines are going to to differ. Um, so other, uh, other questions that we've got here to consider, um, what is the risk that your condition could rapidly progress if you didn't get the procedure um, or test? Uh, what is the, what does the best available da data say about the risks of waiting? Um, this is really, I would say this is a, a kind of a tricky thing. I've been doing a lot of virtual visits and um, I've been taking them sort of one at a time. Um, there are certain things uh, that, you know, we know are a little bit more peculiar to COVID, uh, things like fever, losing sense of smell, taste, that sort of thing that may increase my thought process that someone has it, but also underlying health conditions like COPD and, and also being on immunosuppressives. So um, uh, these are all things that, that kind of weigh into my mind. Uh, with respect to testing. So I think this is very individual and it's also going to depend on the center you're at and the rules that are in place. We still have shortages of testing uh, swabs and media. So, um, you know, you've got to work with your, your local health system about, you know, getting the test and access to the test. And it is, it is going to um, differ. But I think that um, some of those symptoms in particular that I mentioned do in increase the potential um, uh, likelihood um, that that it may be it, that it may be COVID. Um, we have another question here: Are the alternatives that will uh, be adequate to prevent rapid progression? Um, uh, in the meantime, if you delay, um, so here we're we're talking about um, again, kind of you know these routine um, the routine uh, medical care. Uh, you know, I myself have been pushing off the dental visits and, and other things that I would um, normally get. I think the health system is really trying to, as quickly as possible, bring things back in a phased way, depending on the urgency. So I suspect things like colonoscopies um, and, and pap smears and things like that are probably going to be um, at the end. Um, but uh, things that are considering uh, to be, you know, slightly more urgent. Let's say you've got something like a, you know, a tooth that's starting to hurt, um, things like that. I think we will start to be able to um, to get people in for that sort of thing. And certainly, I would say things like cancer, we're definitely dealing with now. Um, that is is definitely um, uh, something that um, we are are definitely bringing people in for and definitely figuring out how how to manage. It'll be a little bit at the judgment of your provider, but we are starting to to ramp up slowly. Um, and I think there will be um, individual guidance uh, available sort of on a health system level. So check with your health system and your provider on a frequent basis to determine at what point. Um, I know at the University of Michigan, for instance, we as providers are looking at the list of all the stuff that we ordered on a weekly basis, and they're starting to let us start to get some of those patients in on a highest need basis. So um, I do think that these sort of elective things are going to start to happen over the next couple of months. Again, we're going to see a lot of variation um, uh, across across the country. Um, I don't know, Bar Byron, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, it would be nice if there was a, a, a national plan, but, you know, as you said, it is going to vary depending upon where in the country you might be. 
Uh, and uh, everyone is sort of reinventing medical care here because this is a new issue. But everyone does agree that medical problems need to be taken care of. We understand the importance of overall medical health, and we also understand the risks. So we're trying very hard to fix those issues. Yeah, as you can see on the slide here, it mentions telehealth. We've certainly got some options. Unfortunately, one of the things that we're grappling with in the pulmonary world is how do we get pulmonary function testing for our patients? Yeah. Um, and that's going to be really tricky. Some centers are are, are um, going to go ahead and be doing COVID testing before you get a PFT. Others are not. And again, those are sort of institution by institution decisions based on prevalence and risk. Um, so again, that's likely to vary significantly depending on where you live. Do you want to go ahead and go to the next slide? Thanks, Melon. Uh, Melon brought up this issue, and this is uh, an issue that has gotten uh, put off for a while for all of us, pretty much, and that's the issue of dental care. Uh, and it's obviously an important issue. Uh, in the absence of issues such as gum disease or dental emergencies, the American Dental Association and the CDC have generally avoided, uh, recommended avoiding uh, routine office visits. Uh, the ADA's advisory task force had provided a, a series of listing of, of options, which are listed here, pre-appointment screening, in-office registration, hand sanitization, a patient should always wear a mask, uh, the staff wears appropriate masks and gloves, uh, dental and dental hygienists have been uh, suggested to avoid some of the high-speed aerosol generating tools for the same sort of reasons that Melon was talking about before with nebulizers and other devices. Uh, most spread of this disease is with droplets within, within a, a number of feet, uh, but aerosolizing is possible, uh, and that's why we, we, we have to be careful. You know, I do think we're reaching the point as the world reopens uh, that uh, that patients or people are going to need to start getting their dental care. I think you need to talk to your provider, find out how important it is, uh, and then we'll take each safety precaution step. Uh, you know, again, as with the hospitals opening up and the doctor's office opening up, uh, this will be a stepwise uh, process, uh, starting with the, those in greatest need. Back to you, Jamie. Great. Thank you so much for both uh, for identifying some of these key factors that can help guide our decision making. Uh, we will be putting out additional information and making these questions available as a handout on our COVID-19 page shortly. And welcome your feedback if there's additional issues you face uh, that you think should uh, be considered if you've already gone through some of these deliberations. So before we start to hear from Stephanie Williams, I wanted to remind everyone if you do have questions, you can go ahead and type them into the questions panel so that they are lined up for the conclusion when we will have some time to answer them. So with that, now we will hear from Stephanie Williams. Thank you, Jamie. I am so happy to be here with all of you today to discuss this topic of living with COPD during COVID-19. It really is a stressful time to be living with a chronic condition like COPD during an outbreak like this. And I think that we have seen evidence of this over the last few months, as we have had many questions about how do you know if you're sick with COVID or maybe you're having a COPD flare up. And, you know, I just, um, we want to offer these webinars to you as a way to reassure you and give you information that can equip you to make good decisions about your day to day life. Um, I think there are a lot of you who are with us today or watching the recording. And you're taking, you know, the, the necessary precautions. You're staying home practicing physical distancing, washing your hands for 20 seconds, wearing masks when you must go out. And there are others of you who are still required to go to work. You're providing some essential service and are exposed to the public a bit more than you would like to be. So you're kind of shifting gears a little bit um, from the first half of the, the webinar. Uh, we wanted to talk about a topic that has been coming up a lot in email questions. And I think you may have seen um, Jamie skipped a few slides for me here. We're gonna come back, circle back later on another webinar or maybe another type of event and talk about the action plan that um, those were the slides that we just skipped. So we're gonna talk about some of these questions that have come up on QPD 360 social and other places. And it's face masks. This has been a really hot topic. So first of all, why is wearing a face mask important? Well, 
simply because scientific models suggest that up to 80% of transmission comes from asymptomatic carriers of the virus. So when I say asymptomatic, that means people who don't have symptoms, they don't feel sick, they don't look sick, they don't know that they're spreading a, a, a very serious illness. So this spread of the infection happens not only when people cough, but any time the droplets are released, as we've heard, you know, with Dr. Han and, and Dr. Hamashaw, when they talk about the, the viral particles being on droplets and that kind of thing. So those particles can be released, yes, when you're coughing, but it can also be released when sneezing or coughing or laughing or singing. Anything that you would, um, anytime you might be in close contact with someone that's doing any of those things, you would want to have a barrier between you and them. So it makes sense that we want people to wear masks to prevent the spread of droplets during those times. So make no mistake, I'm not trying to, to say that wearing a mask is easy because it is not. Wearing a mask can be really difficult. We have listed some of the reported reasons why people don't like to wear masks here. And you can see them, you know, I get short of breath, my anxiety increases, I have this sensation of suffocating. In fact, yesterday, um, the British Lung Foundation just posted some comments on their Facebook page that speaks to the difficulty that people with respiratory problems can have when wearing a mask. And so with that in mind, um, we'd like to be uh, helpful for you. And so we wanted to talk about different types of masks and face coverings. Um, so before we get too far into this discussion, I want to emphasize that you should wear the mask or face covering that is right for you. If it's uncomfortable or it doesn't fit properly, you will likely end up not wearing it or not going places you need to go, or you'll find yourself touching your face to provide relief, um, which is definitely something you shouldn't do. The N95 masks that we've all heard so much about are what we recommend for healthcare professionals, ones that are doing direct patient care in those situations where they're dealing with COVID or, uh, or suspected COVID patients. They are really not recommended for people with breathing problems because they do fit very tight to the face and don't allow for much air movement. And that's kind of the point, right? You don't want air to be moving in around the edges of the mask because you may be inhaling the particles that have the virus uh, attached to them. So there are other options that we can explore and find one that hopefully works for you. So let's look at a few examples. These are being modeled by some of our COPD 360 social community members. Uh, the first one up in the top left-hand corner is a surgical mask. So as you can see here, it fits snugly over the bridge of the nose, and it comes down below the chin, and it's a little loose on the side. And it could be worn over a nasal cannula if care is taken when, it, when putting it on or taking it off with the mask ear loops. These can be hard to find, though, because they are being used also by healthcare professionals. Um, the middle picture, the more vertical picture, is what you see here is Bill 66 showing us another version of a surgical mask. This one is a little thicker than a normal mask. And his even has a protective film on the inside of the mask as a barrier. So you can see that it fits a little tighter around the edges of the face and provides a little better protection because of the way it fits and because of the thickness of the material used. So, what he what he said to me though was it can still be difficult to breathe through it and he does report that he gets headaches and experiences some shortness of breath when wearing this for long periods of time which he has to do when he's at work so this may not be a good option for everyone so let's look at the bottom left hand corner and we can see an image of a homemade face mask you see this mask covers the nose and comes down well below the chin it has a little bit of a gap to help with that um, smothering or suffocating feeling that tight masks can produce. So if you're considering making a mask or buying a homemade mask from someone else, make sure that it follows the guidance given by the CDC. It needs to have at least two layers of tightly woven fabric and it should fit over the nose and below the chin. Some people are even um, making their mask with a little pocket in between the two layers so you can put a coffee filter, paper towel, or maybe even a Kleenex in that pocket for extra layer of protection. If you also look closely at this picture, you can see that our model has added a little hook made from a vinyl covered paper clip to her mask. So it hooks onto her glasses to keep it from slipping off. This keeps her from touching her face, which is important even while wearing a mask. 
So then looking on the right side of the screen, you can see the face coverings section. These are made from a scarf to top right hand side, bottom right hand side is from a bandana. And if you're having trouble with claustrophobia or anxiety or shortness of breath while wearing the more traditional style mask, these might be good for you to try. They don't fit too snugly to the face and they do allow a little air to come in at the bottom opening. The top right photo is done with a large scarf that starts out being placed over the bridge of the nose and then she wrapped it around the back of the head and then the ends were brought back around to the front and tied up under the chin. Notice here that there are also a series of clips that um, she uses to secure them to her glasses so she doesn't have to reach up and adjust the mask just to keep it in place. And the bottom right picture is simply a bandana folded double and tied at the back of the head. The only place it sits firmly is over the nose and ears, so air is able to enter the bottom opening and can help with that suffocating feeling. Again, find the mask that fits and feels good to you. Um, some protection is definitely better than no protection. So on the next slide, we're gonna look at some things you need to know about wearing a mask safely. Number one, your mask should sit across the bridge of the nose um, it needs to be secure so it doesn't slip and so you don't feel the need to readjust it. Number two, cloth masks should be two layers thick. Again, tightly woven material is recommended. Um, even two layers of t-shirt material is good for mask making. Um, it's, it's flexible, it's comfortable. Um, that is tightly, um, tightly knit enough that it should keep out um, a good deal of, of particles. Um, the fabric should be natural fibers. They're easier to breathe through and they carry moisture away from you. And trust me, because I've, I've been in healthcare a long time, I've worn a lot of masks. You will have moisture in your mask. Um, you'll get hot, um, you'll sweat a little, the moisture created just as you breathe in and out. Um, you'll be surprised at how much moisture there is underneath your mask. So make sure you get a, a good breathable fabric. Number three, wash your hands before putting your mask on. Good hand washing, is crucial at all points in dealing with the spread of this virus. But before you put your hands near your face, please make sure that you wash your hands thoroughly. Uh, number four, refrain from touching your face, adjusting your mask. So anytime you touch your face, you're risking the spread of illness. Not just COVID, by the way, but other bacteria and viruses that are also still out there that we just aren't talking about as much right now. So keep your hands away from your face. Number five, remove your mask by touching only the ear loops. So when you're taking your mask off, you only wanna reach back behind your ears and take the ear loops off from around each ear. Like if I've been to the grocery store, I will use hand sanitizer in the car before I take my mask off. Um, if, I, if it's possible, at least use a sanitizer before bringing your hands close to your face to grab the ear loops. But um, do not touch the face covering portion of the mask at all. Number six, Wash your hands after removing your mask. Please make sure you're washing your hands for 20 seconds after you remove your mask or use sanitizer if you're in your car. Wash your hands as soon as you get home. And um, just another tip, I also keep a canister of cleaning wipes in the garage so I can wipe down my steering wheel, the gear shifter, turn signals, handles, you know, et cetera, when I get home. That way I know everything is clean for my next trip out. Number seven, wash and dry your cloth mask after each use. So put the used mask right in the washer after you take it off. Um, it's good to have several masks for this reason so that you always have one that's clean and ready to use. And number eight, for multi-use masks, store them in a paper bag in a warm place. If you have a mask similar to an N95, place it in a paper bag, leave it in a warm place. The typical coronavirus doesn't tolerate heat very well, so there's some indication that this practice can help reduce the amount of virus, not eliminate, but reduce the amount of virus on the mask surface. Um, remember, please, that physical distancing is still the best policy. But if you have to go out, please wear a mask and wash your hands frequently. Um, that's all I have, Jamie. Back to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Stephanie, this is for tackling this important issue. And thank you to our advocates who shared their pictures. I encourage all of you to share your tips for coping with face coverings and possibly your pictures on COPD360 social. 
Your examples will really help others experiment with what works for them and make others comfortable with the idea of wearing face coverings. Okay. So as we near the end of today's program, we wanted to really recognize the shift in our national dialogue that's really picked up momentum in the recent weeks and discuss a little bit about what reopening the country means for our community. This is really just the start of this conversation and we wanna hear from you about what you're struggling with, what's going well as your communities reopen so that we can be responsive to what's happening on the ground. So it's hard to ignore the, the growing uncertainty and disagreement around reopening, but the fact is nearly every state has begun to roll back restrictions and more loosening is planned in the coming weeks. So as tough it is, it is to cope with, it is important to stress that even if your state has reopened businesses and recreation, it's likely not safe for people with COPD and other high risk populations to let their guard down. The level of risk tolerance for officials that are making these decisions is just not the same for people with chronic, chronic conditions. So we encourage you as do the CDC recommendations to continue to stay home as much as possible and to take all possible steps to avoid exposure to COVID-19. There are a few important issues that we'll be following as states reopen to ensure that our high risk community is able to take the steps needed to protect yourselves from exposure over the long term. High on the list is how states and the federal government will adapt to allow for additional paid leave as businesses open. We know that plenty of people with COPD remain in the workforce and you're facing really tough decisions right now between going back to work and risking your health or losing your job or unemployment benefits. And we, as well as the chronic disease, you know, advocacy community is, you know, we're actively working to identify solutions. We will also be looking to ensure your access to expanded telehealth services is maintained and hopefully expanded to include things like pulmonary rehabilitation. We also hope communities that have jumped into action to protect high risk groups continue to provide these accommodations as reopening continues. Things like added delivery services, contactless pickup, special shopping hours and more. You know, how will states and local communities incorporate physical distancing, especially outdoors and in essential services? You've probably heard many suggest that it's time to reopen because if you're afraid or high risk, you can just stay home. We know that isn't the reality for many of you and we plan to work with you and our colleagues to represent your needs in these discussions. Finally, we can't discuss the topic of physical distancing and extended periods of home isolation without recognizing the reality that this is placing an extreme hardship on many people's physical, mental, and financial well-being. We hope you'll share with us what these impacts are and join in the supportive discussions taking place on COPD 360 social, Facebook, and here on the webinars. We will get through this together. So to close out today's webinar, I wanna make sure that you're aware we have launched our second COPD and COVID-19 experiences survey. We urge you to complete this anonymous survey to share your experiences during COVID-19. This is not a survey just for people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. We want to hear from all of you about how the disease has affected you. Results will help guide future research and future programs and resources to support the community during these trying times. The survey will be available until the end of the month and results from the first survey are available on our coronavirus page. There's a recording under the webinar uh, recordings that highlights some of what we learned from the first survey. And thank you to all of you who have completed the second survey already. So as we transition to our last phase, I wanted to make sure you know that there is support out there. Our goal again is to inform you of important changes in the CDC and WHO recommendations while also adding the context and additional information that's directly relevant to our COPD community. You can find our updates directly from our homepage if you haven't already been there uh, by clicking the top of the page. We'll continue to post regular updates on our blog as well, including the answers to questions you submit, updates on the national response to the coronavirus and other important issues. Please check in often, get support, support others, view new videos and blogs, and let us know how you are doing. Here's some additional credible resources to visit regularly. These sites are continually evolving and providing new information on the disease outbreak, as well as practical action-oriented advice. I would encourage you to consume this information as you see fit. Okay, so before we wrap up, I think we're ready to take a few questions. And as a reminder, you can type your questions directly into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. 
We will do our best to respond to every question, even if, but even if we don't have the time to do so today, um, we will make sure to get you answers to the best of our ability. So please don't hesitate to enter your questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to open it up. And uh, Stephanie, could you read the first question? Okay, sorry. I'm sorry, having trouble with my mute button there. No. Um, um, so the first one I see here is a um, question about masks. Um, so we can open this up to the doctors. What is your opinion about the N95 masks? Oh, great. I think Byron's on mute. And uh, Dr. Tomashaw, oh, yes, if, you, if you can comment on the KN95 mask. Okay, uh, so uh, the most of the masks that Stephanie were talking about are masks that prevent the spread of the disease. Uh, and that's really important as we work together to make this better. Uh, there is a mask that everyone's been aware of, uh, the N95 mask, that is more protective of catching the disease. Uh, that mask is even more difficult to wear for longer periods than, uh, uh, than uh, the mask that we've been talking about before. The other thing, and Melan can comment on this as well, is that's a mask provided particularly for healthcare providers uh, who are who are known to get exposed. I mean, the risks are quite clear in that population. And as Melan could comment as well, for those of us in the healthcare field, we get fitted for our N95 mask every year. So it's not simply a matter of sticking the mask on and be done with it. Uh, you actually have to get special fitting and make sure that it's working correctly in order to be approved for its use. And there was a study that just came out of Singapore uh, that was published in the JAMA Network uh, Open uh, that suggested that uh, of participants, that, that participants, these are the general population, were given N95 respirators with an instruction sheet and then asked to put one on. And only about 13% of them actually passed the visual a uh, mask fit test. So not only is this uh, as, as the N95 mask more difficult to use because it can be more uncomfortable for people who use them, but unless it's pre it's put on appropriately and tested appropriately, you really don't know that it's going to be effective. And many of us worry that those people who have N95 masks in their possession, and there's a lot of them out there, uh, are, are think they're protected and they may not be. And not all N95 masks are the same. There are N95 masks which are not as effective as others. So I would stress at this point in time that N95 masks are basically related to healthcare providers who have been fitted and tested. Uh, Melan, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I would just echo what you said. You know, the mask part may work, but unless it fits absolutely 100% snugly around every single part of your nose and your cheek and your chin, then it actually can still let viral particles through. And there's a lot of things I think people don't realize that skin folds and, for instance, beards, mustaches um, may make, turn an N95 essentially into a regular mask. Now, again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be focused on wearing the, the face mask or the covering to protect other people. But um, if, you're, if your concern is to protect yourself like the healthcare workers, it has to fit absolutely perfectly. Um, and that's why, for instance, the University of Michigan, because they couldn't get their masks from the usual supplier, just bought a new type of N95. And we all had to go in and get refitted with a different size um, because the make and model had changed. I think I also heard the term KN95 in the question. Um, it, just so people are aware, that is actually an N95 type of mask that's made in China, and they have their own standards. Um, the uh, and it it's slightly different than the U.S. mask, and and some of the hospitals here have been um, starting to use those, but have been testing them to make sure that they're they're fit for use. So it's it's raised all sorts of complications for the hospitals because they, they're not getting it from their same suppliers and, and they knew the fit and that sort of thing. So that, that may be more detail than our listeners need, but that kind of helps you to understand some of the nuances within 95. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Our next question is um, recognizing that, that COVID-19 isn't the same as the flu. Have they looked at 
uh, Tamiflu as a potential treatment. Melan, do you have any? Yeah, data I have to. I have to admit, I haven't. Um, I haven't seen that. the The type of virus, though, that that um, that uh, COVID is, which is a coronavirus, is very, very, very different um, than the type of than the than the influenza virus. So, um, I don't think that there were initial thoughts that 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 particular drug was necessarily going to work. Um, I think based on on the the uh, structure of the virus and what they know from our prior SIRS and and MERS, so, sorry, prior SARS and MERS um, infections that that they tried to to um, deal with previously, which is uh, was one of the reasons why they kind of went out of the gate with remdesivir. I I would agree with that completely. I I would also stress something that I think really important, and it it's a little bit about the hydroxychloroquine, but it's about other medicines as well. Medicines like Tamiflu, medicines like famotidine. Uh, there is a lot of of obvious hope and interest in an, an available drug, a drug across the counter, or a drug that's available in pharmacies with a prescription uh, will make a difference. Uh, the data just isn't there yet. Uh, and all of these medicines, even the medicines that have been approved, even the medicines that are now over the counter because they've been around for such a long time, all medicines carry side effects uh, and carry risk. Uh, we need to know that the medicines we're using have a reasonable chance of being effective. Yeah, I just looked up quickly. It looks like there, there may be some studies that are looking at Tamiflu, but we just don't have any data yet. Okay. Great, thank you. So we've got a, a couple similar uh, questions around the concept of, of opening up and you know, what is safe and when is it time. And the the topics are um, that that our listeners are questioning are you know what should I do about going back to work, especially if that work is in a healthcare facility. And also we have one person who's questioning when is it going to be safe and and how could I um, lift the spirits of a, a friend and family member who is in a group living situation where they're not allowing visitors? When will it be safe to visit again? Uh, well, let me take the second one and I'll give Melan the first one because I have no answer to the first one at all. I, you know, the, the second one, the group living is a real problem. I mean, obviously, uh, there have been a number of issues. You know, one of the first, uh, the first major outbreak was in a uh, nursing home in uh, Washington and uh, and obviously in New York and other places, there have been significant uh, losses in work in, in nursing homes. These are older people. They often have many comorbidities. Uh, I, you know, it, it's obviously a very difficult situation. And the people who are, you know, who are trying to help in those situations have suggested that we need to limit the exposures. Uh, and I understand that. Uh, I, I don't have a simple answer to this question. You know, I think that hopefully as we work through it, there will be uh, ways of reestablishing the connection. I would suggest at this point that you take advantage of FaceTime and, and other connections. It's not the same as laying on hands, and I understand that. Uh, but just as many of us are doing with our grandchildren, we need to do with our parents and our grandparents as well uh, until it's safer to open things up. Uh, Melan, the broader question of going back to work in this environment. Oh, this is such a hard one. I have gotten so many phone calls, emails, messages from patients, all with chronic lung conditions, wanting to know, can they go back to work? And I have some patients that work in hospice. I have patients that work in hospitals um, themselves. And so this has been really, really, really hard. And um, I think there is not going to be a one size fits all answer. Clearly, no matter how many um, protections you take, there's always some risk with going out. There's some risk associated with um, being in a healthcare setting. So I think uh, that you've got to think both about what your condition is and then also the type of setting that you might be working in um, and have a very frank discussion with your doctor. I mean, for some patients, they can afford not to work. And other patients, you know, it would be very, very difficult if they weren't working. So it's very difficult to pr provide a, um, I think, across the board answer. And I've really just been trying to counsel my patients individually based on everything I know about their situation. 
I think that that's the only way we can do this now. I mean, you know, I do think that that more the more testing we do, the better off we'll be able to gauge. You know, I think that that's a concern that many in the healthcare field continue to have uh, because the availability of testing, the availability of protective materials, still not quite where it needs to be. It's better than it was, but it's still not where it needs to be. I think the testing will make a difference. It wasn't part of the question, but I, I do want to touch on something that I think all of us in the healthcare field have been uh, been saddened by. I mean, my colleagues, particularly those who have been spending more and more time in the hospital, uh, describe the fact of, of, of patients dying alone, uh, of not being with their family at the end. I We all fully understand how terrible that is uh, for everyone involved. Uh, and I think everyone needs to know that the healthcare providers who are out there are doing the best they can to try to address that issue and to try to hold the hands. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And I think the question around work is another reason why we are uh, so interested in seeing that issue addressed at the policy level um, so that we can make sure there are options uh, so that people don't have to risk their health if that is an issue. Uh, so quickly, going to take two last questions, and then we will make sure to get back to others with responses. Uh, hopefully, a, a simple one: Can CO2 increase when you're wearing a mask, whether it's cloth or or disposable ones? That is a really good uh, question. It's funny. I was actually just researching something slightly related the other day, which was um, whether. Uh, breathing through scuba gear increases your carbon dioxide. It may be somewhat similar. Um, it certainly can, and I, at least with the scuba gear, um, a snorkel, uh, potentially. So I, I would say it's probably a potential if it's absolutely non-breathing. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, potentially something that's looser fitting um, probably is not going to be uh, a significant issue. But I have to admit, it's a bit of a guess. Byron, what do you think? I would guess the same thing you just guessed, but I, I think under most circumstances, it's probably not a major issue. I mean, the question would be in patients who are chronic uh, CO2 retainers, uh, who therefore may have a little less margin to, of, of error, if you will. It may be a little more of an issue. I don't think most of the available mass would cause that, but yeah. it is a concern. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, to close this out, we've had several questions come in related to pulmonary rehab. Uh, so could you share your thoughts on when will it be safe and what are the considerations for reopening pulmonary rehab? And what about some strategies uh, outdoors or things like uh, mall walking or outdoor tracks and as an alternative for maintenance in the meantime? I'll let Mayline start and then I'll finish. Yeah, I, at least at the University of Michigan, it's unclear when and how our pulmonary rehab is, is going to be um, reopening. Um, and I think that'll probably depend on the setup of the facility and whether they feel like they can maintain, um, for instance, the social distancing and have enough space to allow people to exercise safely. Um, so again, I think that's gonna probably depend a little bit on the facility. What I have been recommending to my patients in the meantime um, has been, you know, to do a combination of uh, light weights and what they can do indoors. I think getting outside in particular and walking is an excellent option. I, I think outside, to be honest, is probably your safest bet, um, even though, for instance, if someone has COVID and they've coughed, because of the massive amount of air circulation outside, those viral particles are going to be dispersed pretty quickly. So um, I, I really like the option of exercising outside for when it's feasible for patients. And I would agree with that as well. Uh, I also want to stress that I and I'm sure Melan agrees. A pulmonary rehab works. Uh, it is uh, it's uh, it's ludicrous that uh, only a couple percentage of the people with COPD in this country actually ever have the ability to complete pulmonary rehab. Uh, that's not acceptable. Uh, and uh, the answer, I think, going forward from a personal standpoint is to develop telemedicine, tele-rehab programs that work. 
you know, for those of us who are new to telemedicine, a couple of months ago, I would never have thought there was much role in metropolitan areas, that it would have more of a role in parts of the country where there may be hundreds of miles between specialists, for example. I've changed my mind. You know, I think that telemedicine is going to be a large part of our future, that hopefully the technology will develop to allow us to make it more and more successful. Uh, so that we can allow people to continue to live their lives and not necessarily schlep into doctor's offices all the time. That doesn't mean there will not be the need for in-person visits. Those will always continue. But they can, I think, become more limited as we develop telemedicine. I believe the future of pulmonary rehab is with telemedicine. You know, there, you know, you know, to go from I think our ability to take us from the one or two or three or four percent of people on rehab to much higher levels will depend upon developing tele tele rehab programs that work. This is our opportunity to do that. And then we need to push to make sure that we get the reimbursement to make it possible. Great. Thanks so much for answering uh, these questions. And again, if your question wasn't answered, we will do our best to work with our experts and medical advisors and get you responses next week. So that's all the time we have for today. We hope you've been able to take away some practical knowledge and, and tips, and I know I have, and learn something new every time. So finally, we'd like to take a moment to thank our partners who provided critical funding for COVID-19 response activities. And uh, as Corinne mentioned in the beginning, in particular, Theravance Biopharma, which has provided support for our webinar series. It takes a village and we're grateful for all of your support and for the companies who are allowing us to introduce these new research and, and services for you. So with that, I will say thank you once again and close out for today.